One thing I never tend to get right on the first try are loops in Houdini. And what loops allow you to do, for example, is this kind of fractal structure, which kind of looks like a Christmas ornament or a snowflake at the moment. And in order to build this snowflake, what we need to do when you look at it is we take one shape and clone the same shape on the edge points of it and repeat that. So in each step, the child objects are just smaller versions of the parent object cloned to the edge points of that parent object. So we can basically repeat that with a, with a process called a loop. And what we do in a loop is uh, we repeat the copying over and over again and just take the previous copy step as an input for the next copy step. Let me show you how to build that. In Houdini, we're just going to create Geonode, dive in there. And uh, one small trick, if that SOP is somewhere and you don't know where it is, space and H just centers that. So select it and delete it because I want to replace it with a platonic solid. And let's set this to icosahedron. Perfect. The first thing I'm going to take care of is creating that loop construct. So creating a looping section in our SOPs. And the way that is done is with a for loop. That is here. And this creates these two nodes. And what they allow me to do is repeatedly execute the SOPs that I put in here. Let me explain. My input goes in here. So that's going to be my platonic in this case. And um, nothing much to adjust here in the input node. In the output node, however, um, I have several options. And the main option that I'm going to use now is the iteration. So how many times this construct should run. So let's just set it to two for our case. Everything else uh, can be left at default for our case. But we need one thing which we will later use. But let's first set up the copying. So I'm going to put a copy sub in here. And I want to create instances of that object on the structure here. And I want to pipe that into the output. So let's highlight the output here, zoom out a bit. And when I highlight the output and play with the iteration slider, I can see that I now um, built a construct, that I now built a loop that takes this input geometry here, that thingy basically, and for each point in that input geometry, it creates a copy of the same geometry and puts it there. So let me dial that up. I have now copies at each edge point and again and again. However, there are several things that bug me with that. One thing is that these copies are oriented towards the normal, so they point outwards. I don't want that. So I go into the copy shop and switch off transform using template points attributes. So now they are just um, oriented as they were when they came into the copy shop. Another thing that's annoying me is that they stay the same size, so you cannot really see what's happening um, underneath them. For each iteration, what I need to do or what I want to do is scale them smaller. The way I'm going to do that is with a transform sop. I'm going to go in here, add a transform sop, put that in here. And what I need now is a value that indicates me in which iteration I am here. So how many times this construct has already been run. And this is the part where it gets a bit weird. And this is the part where um, I tend to need to look up stuff. So um, bear with me. But the, but the main thing is really straightforward. So you just highlight the input node, um, go here and say create meta import node. So this created this node here. And when I highlight that, and go into the geometry spreadsheet to have a look at which attributes it creates or uh, it has. And I go on to the detail attributes, I can see I get these attributes. And what they are is basically variations on the iteration number. And what I want to use in our case is this value here called the iteration. And what I want to do is feed this value here into the transform sop and use it as a scaling factor. And the way that it is done, I'm going to influence this uniform scale here, is with a small expression called detail. It's this thing here. 
and detail takes several attributes. Um, on the one hand, the path to the SOP where it uh, grabs the detail from. So I'm gonna do it like that and then go to repeat begin metadata. That's where my metadata comes from. Then I need to tell it which attribute to import, which detail attribute. And when I head back here, it's called iteration. So let me get back into transform and type in iteration. Let me check. Yes, iteration. And it also needs an index um, just in case if we have an array as an attribute. So we tell it explicitly which component of the array to use, which element. But um, in our case, this can just be zero. Something like that. Let's go back to the scene. And the thing that happens here is as my iteration is set to zero, my transform um, will be set to zero as well. So the input geometry will be scaled to nothing. Um, what I can do instead is um, use the i value, which will um, be a value plus one, um, or I can just manually add a plus one here, whatever you like better. So when I increase the iterations now, I see the scale increases as well. That's because my iterations number here course increases. Just let me show you. So this increases. So um, what I could do is either um, do a complement here. So one minus or just um, divide one by this value that we created here. So this will get smaller now over time. Another thing I could do when I don't like that scaling behavior is instead of dividing one by the iteration number is I could use the iteration number to power another number. That means multiplying a given number by itself x times and x in our case um, is the iteration number. Just let me show you. So I have this here. This is my iteration number plus one. And what I want to do is power say 0.4 comma by this iteration number that I created here. So if I have two iterations, it will do 0.4 times 0.4. If I have three iterations, it will do 0.4 times 0.4 times 0.4 and so on, which gives a nicer progression in scale. That's what I have here. I like that better. But as you can see, there's one thing that we need to fix still. And that is the uh, previous geometry that we created does not get carried over here. And the way we can fix that is in our end node here. And instead of feedbacking each iteration, we want to merge each iteration. And now you can see all those iterations except for the first one merge. And in order to get the first geometry merged as well, I'm going to do that manually with a merge node and put in our for loop here and our basic geometry in here, highlight that. And now I have that construct with all the geometry in here. So this is the basics of uh, how we build that fractal structure with a for loop. What I can do now is, for example, um, put that structure in a poly wire, wire that up here, maybe scale down the radius a bit, divisions by three, highlight that. Now that takes quite a while. And there we have it, a fractal structure outlined as a wireframe, which we can now export or render in Mantra. So the things that I'd like you to remember is this, the for loop structure um, consists of two nodes and input. So a start uh, and an end node. All the uh, main settings are done in the end node. And um, within the start node, you can create a metadata import node, which will give you 
um, amongst other things, the current iteration value, which is uh, very useful for influencing um, different parts of your um, structure that you build here, for example, the transform node here. And the way you access that is by this detail expression here, which wants the path of the node, the name of the attribute to import, and uh, the index of an attribute element, just in case it's an array. If it's not an array, just put zero in there. This is a very useful construct. However, it's a bit quirky with those three nodes that you need to set up. And it's one of those constructs that I um, always keep in a separate file and just load it. So in order, I don't have to um, recreate it and just be quicker. And um, that is one useful tip I'd um, like to give you to um, keep the stuff that you do in Houdini, Houdini in a library so you can access it really quickly. Because as you may have noticed at this point, Houdini heavily, heavily, Houdini heavily relies on you building certain functions and certain functionality yourself. So in order to be quick on your future projects, it definitely makes sense to save them in a well curated library. That was it for today. As always, if you have questions, if you have any feedback, please let us know. If you create any artwork, please let us know. Um, we're really intrigued to see what you guys come up with. And if you have any ideas of how to improve that, any hints, any workflow hints, please share them. Um, we're really interested to uh, get to know how you guys work. So thanks, cheers, and goodbye.